Je suis ravi d'accueillir le professeur Stephen. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Stephen Toop at IDRC this afternoon. Because of the demonstrations outside, um, uh, we're trying to be a little bit uh, more moderate to allow people to get here. Uh, avant de prendre la direction de l'école Monk, before taking charge of the Monk School in 2014, Professor Toop was a president and vice chancellor at the UBC from 2006 to 2014. I'm a past student. Elliot Trudeau Foundation and Dean of Law at McGill University. Professor Toop has also served as the chair of uh, what we now call Universities Canada, formerly Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada, and he currently serves as president of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, director of the Public Policy Forum and the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, and president of the Canadian Council on International Law. Professor Toop has also served as chair of the United Nations Working Group on Enforced and Involuntary Disappearances. Among his many awards, last year, Professor Toop was appointed an officer of the Order of Canada. Congratulations. Le CLD et l'école Monk partage... The Monk School and IDRC have a mutual interest in research and the development of solutions to some of the most difficult issues in the world. So, with the IDRC, he works with the Cyber Steward, directed by a Professor uh, Toop. Our IDRC shares a strong mutual interest with Monk and with Professor Toop through support to researchers around the world. I'll just give a few examples, and these would include um, supporting research to scale basic legal services in developing country contexts, supporting research to develop more accountable, effective, and transparent institutions around large uh, land uh, investments in Africa, or to confront urban violence and exclusion in cities across Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And uh, lest I forget, uh, since uh, the key person is here in this room, uh, a new partnership with Global Affairs Canada to build research capacity in support of the democratic transition or transition towards democracy in Burma. Dealing with governance challenges often means confronting larger and seemingly intractable political debates. And progress on governance challenges often is measured in very small and gradual gains often very intangible or harder to capture than in other spheres of development work. The large uh, uh, growth uh, in the middle classes uh, in the last several decades, that is, in the millions of people now living on more than $10 a day uh, in countries like China, Mexico, Indonesia, India, and even Brazil, uh, has been associated uh, with strong pressures for improvements in governance. Though typically such positive pressures need years to produce real changes in governance. We appear to be entering into a prolonged period of slow growth. Will such slow growth undermine the prospects for positive governance change? The topic of today's talk, what difference will the governance targets under the Sustainable Development Goals make, is of great interest to Canadian and international stakeholders seeking sustainable change uh, to the challenges that still confront us. Will a global commitment under the Sustainable Development Goals help in confronting these challenges? Will having an internationally agreed upon set of targets and indicators more practically improve? existing efforts. S'il vous plaît, joindre à moi pour accueillir le professeur. So please join me to welcome Professor Stephen Toop.
Merci beaucoup pour. Uh, Thank you so much for this uh, warm introduction. Il me fait un très grand honneur d'être ici. I'm very honored to be here today to talk with a very distinguished audience. I know that there is a traduction simultanée. Well, let me start with an admission. I'm a lawyer. Forgive me. My professional formation biases my understandings of governance and its relationship to development. The same would be true were I an anthropologist, a sociologist, a political scientist, or God forbid, an economist. I think it is important to admit our professional biases because they affect our analytic predispositions. More importantly, they shape our understanding of method and measurement. What are your predispositions and biases? Like most lawyers, not all, mine are as follows. A strong belief in the manipulability of data, even a slight distrust of data, linked to a commitment to argument as the basis for sound decision making. An instinctive comfort with institutions, especially formal but also informal ones, and a confidence that power and politics can be influenced, indeed shaped, by norms. Now, perhaps I'm overstating the case, but I do so both for effect and to prompt you to challenge me during question period. So please keep these predispositions and biases in mind as I explore a set of issues that is tough to parse, highly political, and I think fundamentally important. Essentially, I want to explore a basic question. Does governance matter to economic and social development? I'll do so by thinking through the transition from the Millennium Development Goals, MDGs, to the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, I'm going to conclude with an assessment of how best to link governance issues to the overall goals of the SDGs. Now, many years ago, I gave another speech at IDRC right here, and it's good to be back after a sojourn in university administration. That speech was about lessons learned from a decade or more of work in legal and judicial reform in the Global South. That speech was highly pragmatic and practice-based. Since then, I've gone on to publish a theory of international obligation that draws on practice-based accounts of how societies are shaped from a legal standpoint. I'm going to draw on that account gently in these remarks. Don't worry, I promise not to overload you with legal theory. But just as I want to expose my own biases, I also want to be clear about my theoretical frame, which is pragmatic in Aristotle's sense of purpose-driven and rooted in practices as both generators of norms and continuing tests of normative validity. Before I go any further, I've got to pause and ask a couple of pretty basic questions in a speech about governance. What does the term mean and how is it typically used? It's important to note that some folk argue that governance is a dangerous idea. Dangerous for different reasons. Observers suggest that governance is a way to substitute elite accommodation for democratic politics. We move away from government, which implies some public accountability, to governance, which may mean simply the rule of technocrats and professionals. Others argue that governance is a means by which globalization with its transnational business elites colonizes national space. The local is displaced by transnational standards that are designed to further the economic interests of dominant powers. Colonization can take place in another way as well, others suggest through the colonization of social discourse, including traditional legal discourse by economists. On this account, governance is a way for economists to create political cover to do work that was otherwise law. The World Bank is the classic villain of this piece, 
turning law and governance more generally throughout the late 1980s and 90s into a mere instrument tested on whether it facilitated economic growth or not. Even today, the World Bank definition of governance in the World Governance Indicators is, quotes, the manner in which power is exercised in the management of a country's economic and social resources for development, end quotes. For me, that definition of governance is too instrumental. Governance holds no intrinsic value, but matters only as a management tool for development. Now, I think that all of these concerns are valid in theory, and they should cause us to be wary of uncritical invocations of the term and even the underlying ideas of governance. But that said, I want to sweep away the objections, because in the world as we find it, the governance is surely here to stay. So let's deploy it wisely and try to empower people by its invocation. So you see, I'm not wholly opposed to soft instrumentalism. My comments so far reinforce the view that defining governance is highly political. In the voluminous literature, proposing any encompass encompassing definition is controversial. And yet, there seems to be a broad consensus uh, that internationally agreed upon standards of governance could be decidedly helpful. Here we might learn from the recent approach of the Paris climate change talks. Rather than providing a detailed definition with agreed upon content, we should be aiming for high level inclusive standards that are implemented through achievable nationally established targets. As an attempt to articulate just such a high-level standard, I like the United Nations Development Program definition of governance better than I do the World Bank's. The UNDP focuses on the requirement that legal, bureaucratic, and administrative mechanisms be responsive to the needs of people. It therefore defines governance as broader than institutions integrating the relations between a state and its people. Now, I would add that governance must also consider the relations between other social actors, like private enterprise and civil society and the people. These relationships may be mediated through state regulation, but governance involves all of society not merely government and people, and I'm going to return to this point later. In a very helpful policy brief for the United Nations University, Frank Bierman and colleagues succinctly identify three different aspects of governance. Good governance, referring to qualitative characteristics surrounding rulemaking and institutional foundations. Effective governance, referring to the capacity of institutions to resolve problems and deliver public service, and equitable governance, referring to the equitable application of the rule of law and distribution of wealth and opportunity within society. So good governance, effective governance, equitable governance, all tied together. In attempting to improve governance, states would, be, would do well, I think, to consider all three of these elements. However, we must admit that improvements in all three areas are harder to achieve in some countries than in others. Local variation will be important, and I'll come back to this point. Even with the high-level goal, local-level target approach that I'm suggesting, Agreeing on how to improve governance in diverse settings and systems will continue to be a big problem. First, even the potential high-level standards that we might articulate are not as inclusively supported by established norms as I think we like to believe in countries such as Canada. For example, I've spent much of my working life buttressing, or trying to, the international human rights regime. Sadly, 
I've come to the conclusion that despite widespread, often close to universal ratification of key human rights treaties, many human rights norms are simply not supported around the globe. A shocking example is the anti-torture rule, often said to be peremptory or fundamental in international law. When you look around the world, practices of torture are widespread across regions and cultures. Since September 11, 2001, forms of torture have even gained acceptance in some Western states. Now, I am glad to say that such acceptance has been strongly resisted. George W. Bush and his friends failed to force a reinterpretation and softening of the anti-torture rule, and they tried hard. But my point remains salient. Even seemingly powerful human rights rules are subject to constant contestation and even repudiation and not just by Islamic radicals in Islamic State or harsh authoritarians like Kim Jong-un or Bashir al-Assad. If it's true that for seemingly universal norms like the rule against torture, that the rule is not inclusively supported, it's even more so for norms that are less established or more prone to uncertain meaning because of their vagueness or their high ambition. We all know from sad experience that gender equality means many different things in different cultures. Corruption is not easily defined in societies where there are powerful expectations that an individual will do everything possible to help members of his or her extended family. Democratic government can mean elections, yes, but it can also mean alternative forms of public consultation, like village councils or kinship group-based assemblies, such as the Pashtun Jirgas of Afghanistan. And are elections really democratic if they cost hundreds of millions of dollars and are paid for by a small elite? Now, my point is emphatically not that we should give up on governance, that it's simply too hard. In my view, that was a mistake in the MDGs. It's worth recalling that the Millennium Declaration adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2000 outlined the importance of governance as a development priority. Point six of the Declaration, and I quote, Men and women have the right to live their lives and raise their children in dignity, free from hunger and from fear of violence, oppression or injustice. Democratic and participatory governance based on the will of the people best assures these rights, end quote. Despite this, as you all know, in the creation of the MDGs, governance was not made a priority for measurement, either as a goal or even for the most part in the targets and actions. Now, the reasons for this are not hard to discern. In 2005, Marilee Grindle, who's the Edward S. Mason Professor of International Development at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School, wrote, Good governance is deeply problematic as a guide to development. Getting good governance calls for improvements that touch virtually all aspects of the public sector from institutions that set rules to organizations that manage administrative systems to human resources that staff government bureaucracies. Not surprisingly, advocating good governance raises a host of questions about what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, and how it needs to be done." End quote. This view that governance is inordinately complex and hard to contain no doubt fed the idea that the MDGs should avoid governance as much as possible. Now note that Grindle is a political economist. That means that her training was devoted to rigorous data analysis and designed to enable prediction. There's a strong tendency in contemporary economics and political science to eschew normativity. The interesting questions are not related to oughts or shoulds, but to hows and whys. 
Now, there is, of course, pushback against this attitude in behavioral economics and amongst young, norm-interested political scientists. But econometric obsessions still predominate. The MDGs were also predicated on a belief that more would be achieved with clearly delineated indicators of success. In the well-intentioned pursuit of, quotes, measurable outcomes, end quotes, the world chose to focus primarily on goals that lent themselves to quantitative indicators. Yes, much was achieved. And yes, quantitative indicators can provide both encouragement and seemingly straightforward measures of accountability. However, they can also be misleading, especially when data is aggregated to a high level, and they show success that turns out not to be sustainable if governance questions are ignored. Last year, I was privileged to attend a small dinner with Bill Gates, at which he agreed to answer questions. Now, I wanted to pursue the issues that I'm addressing now. How does governance factor into his thinking about development? Luckily, I didn't have to intervene. Two far more credible people jumped up. To my mild surprise, they were CEOs of mining companies, one operating in Africa, one in Asia. They said that in their experience, the greatest impediments to development were all related to governance. Failure to distribute economic benefits equitably across communities, high level and low level corruption, resistance to any forms of worker organization on the part of the state. Now, I want to be absolutely clear that I am an admirer of what Bill and Melinda Gates have accomplished. However, at that dinner, Mr. Gates refused to take on board governance questions. Perhaps they make him feel uncomfortable because they're innately political. As likely, in my view, he is characteristic of almost all tech entrepreneurs who become philanthropists. What you can measure matters, and what is hard to measure should be jettisoned. I'll return to measurement later. For now, I want to suggest that government governance really does matter, despite how hard it is to measure. Now, here I'm certainly not alone. In its final report, the UN Millennium Project identified governance failures and policy neglect among the key reasons for shortfalls in achieving the MDGs. It recommended that poverty reduction strategies provide a framework for capacity building, strengthening governance, promoting human rights, and engaging stakeholders across all sectors. So let's be frank. The MDGs were a partial success, which implies that they were also a partial failure. As Anthony Lake of UNICEF laments, and I quote, disaggregate the data and we find that our statistical national successes are masking moral and practical failures. People are left behind simply because they live in rural communities or urban slums, in conflict zones, as part of indigenous communities with disabilities, or because they are girls, end quote. My suspicion is that focusing on governance might help to address some of these failures. At the same time, I acknowledge that governance is hard to incorporate into development goals. As I've already suggested, it cannot be defined in detail at a global level because good, effective, equitable governance will not look the same in all settings. Even high-level consensus is hard to achieve. So where does that leave us in the transition to the SDGs, where goal 16 is to, quote, promote peace and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels, end quote. And of course, Goal 16 has an underlying role to play in many other, if not all, of the 17 SDGs. Peace, justice, and strong institutions that are effective and equitable are fundamental to the delivery of quality education. Goal 4, 
decent work and economic growth, goal eight, reduced inequalities, goal 10, and responsible consumption and production, goal 12, to name but a few. As a result, goal 16 has the potential to shape development dialogue for the next decade. Interestingly, there is data to suggest that there are some hopes within diverse populations that are similar, even if their operationalization turns out to be highly variegated. A useful study by Edwards and Romero revealed that in a multi-country attitudinal survey, quotes, having an honest and responsive government was between the second and fourth most important priorities of respondents across all countries, end quote. Note that political freedoms ranked far down as a shared aspiration between the 11th and 16th most important priorities across countries. A similar finding emerged from the analysis of the UNDP as it considered the post-2015 uh, post development landscape. Quotes, accountability is a key theme running through and underpinning many aspects of governance. The Overseas Development Institute also adopted an approach to governance that stressed high-level objectives that would need to be met for the SDGs to have the best chance of fulfillment. ODI emphasized what it called, quotes, credible commitments between politicians and citizens, end quotes. These would include the formation of policy shaped by evidence, not the personal interests of leaders, incorporation of opinions from a wide range of social actors, institutions of the state that would be accessible to all groups. I could go on. As the SDGs were being discussed, civil society coalitions, such as beyond 2015, also argued that governance had to be included explicitly and emphasized, quotes, enforceable accountability mechanisms as being key. Perhaps the best encapsulation of change in mood between the MDGs and the SDGs in relation to the role of governance is the following conclusion of the high-level panel charged with articulating a post-2015 development agenda. And I quote, economic growth alone is not sufficient to ensure social justice, equity, and sustained prosperity for all people. The protection and empowerment of people is crucial. This will require peace building and stronger domestic institutions, including effective, accountable, and transparent governments and peaceful, just, and equitable societies that protect and promote human rights and eliminate all forms of violence. Well, that is a mighty ambitious agenda. How best to work towards those goals within the framework of the SDGs? First, we have to identify the relevant actors. As I've already hinted, we have to decide who contributes towards good, effective, and equitable governance. Now, in the 60s and 70s, the answer to that question probably seemed obvious. Government. As one considered the question, how is public policy formed and implemented, the state would inevitably dominate, almost to the inclusion of other social actors. This is simply no longer the case. There are many issues, from financial regulation to energy security to health, where many of the most important players are from non-governmental organizations, corporations, and philanthropic foundations. Examples include the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, which is just about to be replenished here in Ottawa, where civil society partners like the Gates Foundation and corporations like Coca-Cola are as important as many countries. Or the Energy for All Partnership in Asia, promoted by the Asian Development Bank, drawing together states, corporations, and NGOs to provide access to safe, clean, affordable, modern energy to an additional 100 million people. Civil society organizations are often best placed to bring the thoughts of the most affected into discussions relating to defining, measuring, and monitoring progress on governance. What's more, civil society also tends to work through coalitions and can therefore facilitate discussions across sectors about a whole range of central government concerns. 
But if civil society can play a positive role in assisting government assessing and implementing governance initiatives, civil society itself has to be accountable within governance frameworks. Now, by this, I do not mean that governments should impose rigid registration requirements or try to control domestic civil society and ban foreign actors. Such policies are entirely regressive because they limit the diversity of voices brought to the public space. But civil society organizations should be transparent about funding sources and should report publicly on their activities. Now, obviously, these considerations will be strongly modified if an NGO is trying to operate in a highly authoritarian environment. The private sector will also have a role to play in governance and the SDGs. It's increasingly common for private sector actors to design and deliver development initiatives. The most obvious example are the big consultancy firms. But with resource development and infrastructure initiatives, a wide variety of corporate interests is involved. In addition, global private sector actors play an important role in monitoring governance and in ensuring accountable business behavior. I'm thinking of the private businesses that report on political risk. These organizations provide information to government and business looking to expand internationally. Firms performing risk analysis examine issues of governance extensively. Of course, another important role of the private sector is improving its own behavior to become increasingly transparent and accountable. Accountability and transparency are not only issues for public authorities. A wide range of credible studies tells us that business practices are strongly correlated with governance outcomes. By including governance concerns within the SDGs, a strong message is sent to both business and government that they are expected to play by some clearly articulated rules designed to further the interests of the population at large, not merely the interests of economic and political elites. In our era, another actor must promote good, effective, and equitable governance and model it, private philanthropy, especially with the increasing concentration of wealth and social power held by big, primarily American-based foundations. It's hard for these foundations to promote improvements in the public sphere if they are entirely unaccountable and opaque in their own governance. Even accepting the premise that the motivations of plutocratic donors are altruistic, there's simply no reason to defer to any foundation's priorities if there is no input from external actors. And yet, for many foundations, their programs and monitoring frameworks are almost entirely internally generated. I don't think that it's entirely an accident that the creation of the MDGs coincided with the rise of Silicon Valley billionaires and government foundation partnerships. The preoccupation with numeric indicators and the lack of interest in governance are likely correlated to some degree. It's going to be interesting to see whether or not, aside from the Open Society Foundations of George Soros, other major philanthropies embrace Goal 16. Be that as it may, the central point is that governance is no longer the exclusive concern of people in relation to government. People in relation to civil society, to business, and to philanthropy also matters. A second key consideration in trying to ensure success of the NDGs relates, F, uh, the SDGs, excuse me, relates to a central criticism of the MDGs that when disaggregated, it's clear they often failed to reach the poorest of the poor. I'll call this the problem of reach, relying on the work of my monk school colleague, Professor Joe Wong. Failures in reach are not just a set of technical challenges to be overcome. Yes, we can try to improve physical and bureaucratic infrastructures. We can design seemingly simple interventions like nutritional sprinkles, or basic maternal health supply bundles. But first, we have to want to reach the poorest of the poor, and we have to help build local delivery capacity, which implies local governance capacity. Reach is fundamentally a political economic problem of distribution. 
We know, for example, that aggregate, aggregate improvements in child health obfuscate the fact that the disaggregated data for the same countries show that the hardest to reach are often left behind. It's precisely such vulnerable populations that are the most adversely affected by governance shortcomings in terms of good and effective governments, but most importantly, in terms of equitable governance. A third consideration relevant to the success of MDGs is addressing the interwoven constellation of problems concerning community safety, security, peace, and justice. Justice is a highly complex area of governance, and I'll use it just by way of example. Target 16.3 calls upon states to promote the rule of law at the national and international levels and ensure equal access for all. The first difficulty here is to define what we mean by the rule of law. Are we aiming for a thin concept, what the Americans would call due process and we call procedural fairness, or a thicker one implying equitable rules and norms? Once we settle on a definition of the rule of law, a second problem is how to design potentially successful reforms that can actually reshape social behavior, community expectations, and formal institutions. Here's an example. If you think about long-term experience with extremely slow justice institutions, like courts in India, one might suggest alternative dispute resolution, private arbitration, mediation, as a governance improvement. But what if this improves access to justice for the relatively well-off, leaving the inefficient courts for the poor? Does that improve governance overall? Well, it will likely improve the efficiency of commercial transactions and promote investment. But would it aid equitable governance? I've already mentioned a fourth governance consideration that will have a fundamental impact upon the success of the SDGs. First, there's some good news. The governance goals of the SDGs are written in such a way that they apply to all states and societies providing improved access to justice and building effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions. We can all make progress in doing those things. So goal 16 does not create a them and us situation. Nonetheless, we know that there's a huge disparity between low, middle, and high income countries, and this is going to require great differentiation in establishing how to achieve governance objectives within the SDGs. Governance is political, I've already said it. It's also culturally charged, and it has to contend with human societal diversity. Despite the fond wishes of generations of UN secretaries general, there is no international community if by community we mean a group of people with strong shared values. In my view, humans are not all the same, and our aspirations are not uniform. For that reason, the UNDP's important discussion paper on governance and sustainable development accepts diversity in targets and actions as a key pillar to success in promoting good, efficient, and equitable governance. By accounting for regional and national variations in the implementation of governance within the SDGs, flexibility for specific circumstances can be incorporated. Canada and Zimbabwe are not starting in the same position when it comes to establishing governance priorities. So if it's realistic to allow for national target setting within the framework of Goal 16, this seems to be building, as I mentioned earlier, on what is a new thrust in the way we reach international agreements, best modeled by COP21 in Paris and the climate change regime. Another advantage to this approach, I think, is that it's likely to bring doubters to the SDG table. And I'm thinking of important players like China, Vietnam, and India that are inclined to react with skepticism, even hostility, to governance goals that are externally generated and imposed through conditionalities. They would work with allies to undermine such a project, I believe. Embracing sub 
regional and national objectives for meeting governance goals is going to be an important way to overcome barriers presented by differing conceptions of the right ordering of society. Now, having said that, governance must have some core overarching meaning, as I suggested at the outset. If we're truly committed to ensuring that legal, bureaucratic, and administrative mechanisms are responsive to the needs of people, there must be a robust means for people to be heard, transparency in how decisions are taken, and people's voices taken into consideration, and accountability for decisions. Not every system of government and not every process of decision-making will meet the high-level tests. In allowing for diversity and realism, we can't simply accept all arguments for modest action or no action as valid. Now, I just want to say one word which may seem strange for someone who at the beginning said uh, that he's a lawyer who tends to have trust in, in institutions. I think it's very important that we not have an overconfidence in an institutional approach to improved governance. There are many cases where simply reinforcing institutions can actually reinforce oppression. And I've had occasion in giving advice to government over the years to recommend against investments. I remember in a visit to Cuba, my colleague over here was with me on that visit, where I was uh, asked whether or not we should support uh, improvements in the justice system, which were rather focused on efficiency. And the argument was no, because efficiency in the aid of repression is not good governance. There's a lot of background political theory on this, which I'm going to skip over, but uh, I think it's worth thinking very carefully about the role of institutions in governance. I want to conclude with a few observations on the measurement of governance. There's no question that effective measurement techniques played a significant role in advancing the MDGs. Indeed, it can be argued that it was actually the linking of high-level development objectives to concrete measurable goals and targets that was the central innovation of the MDGs. Yet I've already suggested that governance goals in the SDGs will be hard to capture in numeric measures. Trying to measure percentage reductions in forms of abuse or rates of violence, or on the contrary, any percentage improvements is going to be tough because that would involve demonstrating a rate of reduction or improvement on the basis of previous indicators. And in the diverse area of governance, there is little historical data on performance. What's more, the data which does exist is not standardized. There are lots of indicators, but the indicators are reliant on underlying data sets often nationally provided, which are neither commensurable nor often reliable. The MDGs also relied on the measurement and comparison of universal outcome achievements. Good example, universal access to primary education. These are hard to transpose to government governance because it's hard to agree on those high-level, universal, applicable governance standards, except at a level of abstraction that doesn't lend itself to measurement. Absolute targets were also set in the MDGs have between 1990 and 2015 the proportion of people whose income is less than one dollar a day. Now these targets were criticized as arbitrary but they also operated at an aggregate level and as we know they masked regional and national failures. We've all heard the comment that if you remove just China from the calculation the success of the MDGs is dramatically reduced. Well, where does that leave us with measurement? I think what it means is, as often is the case in governments, we're going to be left largely with process-based measurements. I could go on and say more about that, but I think the targets are going to have to be made more specific at the level of actions. They're even at the level of targets now, very, very uh, high level. But even when we create the targets, I don't think we're going to pre create easily measured numeric indicators. I think we're going to have to rely more on process measurements. Now, I want to remind you again that well-established democracies like Canada are going to be expected to identify governance improvements that they will work towards, we will work towards as well.
so too the UN system itself, and we're going to have to deliver on those imperatives at the international and domestic level. One concrete way in which Canada and other countries of the global north can help to promote better measurement of government, governance is through the strengthening of national statistical agencies and in the better coordination of data gathering. There's been an interesting suggestion by a group of academics that by 2020, here's a target, all UN member states could produce a basic set of governance statistics meeting an international standard. Statistics Canada is one of the most highly regarded statistical agencies in the world. Is this a place where Canada might have capacity to lead the charge? So here's my conclusion. Governance was understandably ignored in the first attempt to create comprehensive shared goals for development, the MDGs. It was hard enough to achieve what was achieved without adding to the mix the complicated politics of governance. But inevitably, we discovered that without attention to governance problems, development objectives are undermined and positive results prove hard to sustain over time. So the SDGs include robust commitments to foster good, effective, and equitable governance. And yet we know that these goals will be hard to define and even harder to measure. We're best advised then to keep our global definitions of governance at a high, almost abstract level. But we should push for national targets that relate clearly to the high-level goals and that are linked to measures that are likely to be process-focused. We in the Global North should lead the way by identifying governance improvements that we need to uh, pursue and by declaring our willingness to be measured against our targets. We should also support, dare I say lead, efforts to strengthen statistical agencies around the world and establish data sharing protocols that further the investigation of governance problems. Now, perhaps this approach seems too modest, given the huge governance problems that we know exist in so many parts of the world. But I think it's at least achievable, and that it could lead to practical improvements that we should be doing everything in our power to advance. Thank you. Open the floor for questions. We have microphones, uh, and uh, Professor Toop is wired up. Um, if you examine his tie, you'll not see wired, but wired up. Wired up. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll start uh, by asking uh, questioners to tell us who you are. And uh, Jennifer, over to you. Thanks, Stephen and Stephen, um, for that really compelling presentation and, and talk. Um, I had a lot, have a lot to digest. Um, my name is Jennifer Salahab. I work with IDRC's aptly named Governance and Justice Program, where I manage a program called Safe and Inclusive Cities. And that's the direction that I want to go in. I'd like to um, ask you for your reflections on linking Goal 16 and Goal 11, which is um, about creating safe, inclusive, and sustainable cities. And I'm wondering what challenges and opportunities you see for, um, with respect to cities and municipal governments with respect to improving governance. Thanks. Uh, so there's a lot to say, and uh, let me just offer a couple of observations. Um, first, to take an extreme example of where there clearly are linkages, one could think about also the uh, goal to reduce violence. Uh, so here we have a, a very complicated set of in interactions. So think about the way policing works in many uh, large cities around the world, where uh, police forces uh, can sometimes uh, not have adequate civilian government control and can also be uh, allowed to get away with uh, extreme uses of violence. So this is a, a, a very interesting place where the indicator question comes into play. If we set up indicators that are not carefully considered, uh, and I've just been at a two-day seminar with uh, police chiefs from uh, Latin America, from Colombia, from Brazil, from Mexico City, talking about these issues. Um, if we don't 
develop the indicators well. So let's say we develop an indicator that says reduce the rate of homicide by 50%. Now, we have examples where cities have been able to do that. How do they do it? Well, by arbitrarily arresting, by uh, beating people up, by expelling people from the jurisdiction. Uh, there are all sorts of mechanisms that you could use that would accomplish the goal, but would actually be undermining of any notion of good or equitable governance. Maybe it's efficient, maybe, but it's certainly not equitable. So I think there's an example. Now, a, a less provocative example would be clearly that I think so much of the on-the-ground work that improves the lives of individual people actually does take place at the civic level or the local level, uh, obviously in, in, uh, in small centers, but let's talk about large cities. And that implies that if we're going to really help their lives concretely improve, a lot of work is going to have to be done with civic governance, municipal level governance, because so often that's where the interface between the state and the person is most palpable. It's in the services that are or are not provided. Is there garbage in the streets? Is there sewage collection, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also the place where there can be so easily extremely repressive policies. Think of what's happened over the years in Rio in trying to clean out the favelas and different strategies that have been used. Well, all of that to say that I think there's a huge amount buried in the interrelationship between Goal 16 and improvements at the civic level, and that's something that's going to be really fascinating to see play out over the next few years. Well, I I'm could not go on. Let that go quite yet. Okay. So Canada's got decades of uh, very painful history in trying to build uh, citizen oversight over police forces. Yes. Uh, public commission after public commission, literally, uh, since the time my father was born uh, yeah. until, uh, I think, the early 1970s, and, and indeed, uh, in uh, uh, recent history, uh, uh, Charbonneau Commission at all. Exactly. Uh, uh, clearly, these issues uh, have reappeared. What are the sorts of process suggestions you would make in this particular area for municipal governance right. uh, uh, that might, in fact, uh, speak to Canada's experience on improving oversight of policing? Let me flip it first by saying this may be an area where Canada doesn't have a lot to offer. Ah, okay. Let's be honest about okay. this. I mean, it would be very similar, uh, in my view, to arguing around a supervision of our security services. We have one of the weakest supervisory mechanisms of our security services, so we cannot wander around the world telling people how to improve their governance <laughs> in relation to security services. I'll make sure not to do that. Yeah. I think it's something we have to be very... No, I mean, this... I feel strongly about this. I think we, we should be leading with strengths, not imagining that we are always at the forefront of best practices. We're not. So I would look to many of our European uh, colleagues. I think cities like Copenhagen, uh, I think uh, Stockholm, even in Germany, which is complicated, but I think that the systems that are in place are more effective than any of the systems that we've yet de de designed in Canada. Partly, in my view, without getting into too much detail, because we have politicized those systems. If you look at the city of Toronto, where I currently live, we have a completely politicized oversight board. Uh, and it's used as a, a, a bit of a a mechanism either to undermine the mayor or to undermine the police or to reinforce patterns of abusive behavior on the part of the police, depending on your political views. So, you know, I sure wouldn't look at Toronto as a good example of uh, police oversight. So all of that to say, I think I'd be more interested in trying to draw out some European examples. Good. Please, sir, okay. tell us who you are. Thanks. Uh, uh, my name is John Sinclair. Uh, I'm uh, one of those dreadful economists that uh, you feel are insensitive to the complexities of the political world. When my I heart goes out. My economics, <laughs> I was told in Cambridge in the UK, maybe it's a very primitive world there, 
that politics was the driving force of all economic realities, not economic theory, those mathematical equations which I got lost by. That, that the problem is that's the dominating force in economics today, we, as you world, know. The culture has changed. <laughs> yes. But I spent my time after that working in international development in CEDA, the Canadian Aid Agency, in the World Bank as an institution. And I've been following very recently more the, this whole issue of the SDGs and the, trans, the transition from the MDGs. And that was the point I really wanted to, to talk about just now, because in your overwhelmingly complex analysis, I mean, I must admit, you know, it uh, takes a lot of things to absorb. But I came away with an impression, which I think is slightly false, that the MDGs were a very primitive instrument. They were a very simple instrument. They were politically convenient because we were having the millennium. The millennium doesn't come up that often, so we had to find some goals for it. And, and I think we have to recognize, as you very correctly have, that it was very uneven in terms of its actual impact on the ground. And we still know even today, a, dec a decade and a half afterwards, that it's very hard to know what has happened. My sense, and I have sat in, some of, sat in the periphery of many of those discussions in the UN, so I've seen the, the dynamic, that the SDGs are qualitatively and quant very, very different from what we were talking about. And I think that's very, very important to understand. Because unlike a narrow little elite of half a dozen people designing the MDGs, which is nearly what it was, you had a huge, complex, almost too inclusive process of creating the SDGs. That's why there are so many SDGs, and even more, why there are so many, so many goals, uh, targets that have been created. And I think that is a reflection of the fact that the South, in terms of the equations we're talking about, decided they were going to control that process, that it was not going to be technocrats who sat in Washington or Paris or wherever to do it. And I think that's a very fundamental difference in the way we now have to as an operationalist, as somebody who is interested in transformation myself, how we look for, the, for the, the ways to move forward. And that's really what I was trying to sort of, you know, focus your attention on and say, from the very beginning, the SDGs are political. They are not, de they are developmental because development is all about politics and how societies function. But they were not driven by those mathematical economists. And it was a very different reality. And that's why it would be a very, we're very waiting for your process. question, sir. <laughs> so my question is simply, what does a small actor like Canada, mm. goodwill though we really want to be now, actually do to try and deal with this political dynamic? Because it's the political dynamic, not so much that I'd like to have more money on the table as well, but it's the political dynamic. And therefore, how can Canada, little Canada, relate to that transformation? Thank you. Uh, so I agree with your analysis entirely, and I tried to actually capture some of that in my talk. Um, I think it is fair to say, to be more provocative, that the MDGs were essentially a technocratic creation led by a professor of economics from Columbia University. It's almost as simple as that. Not quite. Not quite. Uh, but there, there was not, as you put it, a very extensive international consultation mechanism. And certainly the Global South was not influential in the development of the MDGs. They, many, many parties were pre present in the elaboration of the SDGs. I think it's amazing they got to 17. That's a, a true achievement. What could Canada do? Uh, I was trying to hint at some of that. First off, part of the politics of the SDGs is that they are applying to international institutions and organizations as well as states. And so reform of institutions is on the table. Now, will we actually see that happen? very complicated to imagine. But that's going to be one of the tests from a developing world perspective, I have absolutely no doubt. Will we actually see changes in the way we have an interrelationship of the international financial institutions? Will the Asian Infrastructure Bank be embraced by more of the West? Uh, what will uh, decision making in the Security Council look like going forward? These are all thought to be part of the governance reform that is implicit in the SDGs. Secondly, the SDGs apply to all states. They're not only targeting developing states. And that's why I commented about the importance of countries like Canada, and here's how I would 
begin to respond to your question, countries like Canada can, I think, play a role by modeling what it looks like to actually adopt goals and targets that are measurable as much as possible and that we commit to. And so by saying, yes, we know that our own processes are not perfect, maybe we could look at our police boards and say, we need to do something serious about reform of that governance mechanism. Uh, I think that will also be one of the tests that many developing countries are going to be looking to, to see whether countries of the global north actually take this seriously and participate in a discussion around their own governance. Now, beyond that, I was trying to suggest that Canada cannot play a dominating role in, in how to have the implementation of the SDGs across the entire world. So I think it's extremely important that we do probably a couple of things. One, think about some areas where there is genuine expertise in Canada that can be offered up to help other countries as they establish targets and goals and measurement. Uh, one of those areas I mentioned was Statistics Canada and the role that they could play in helping design mechanisms of data collection. That's a very pragmatic thing that we're good at and that Canadians seem to like, witness all of the and, and delight in filling out the long-form census again. <laughs> so I think picking thematics and, and, and being tough-minded about where we have expertise and where we don't would be important. And then we, of course, might also want to have some regional foci as well. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to pretend to guess what they should be, but we may want to say on governance, we can really only work in a certain number of areas and we're going to work at it in, intently and, and collaboratively and seriously. A very Canadian answer. I'm, I'm waiting for more questions, but I'm going to draw you out on this one, if I might, Professor Toop. So let's imagine that we do build on efforts of the Canadian National Statistical uh, uh, Agency, and we do try to be catalytic about those efforts because it's a strength, because we believe that we can actually model this behavior and perhaps do it with others uh, in a collaborative fashion. Um, StatsCan is, and the Chief Statistician of Canada, are very focused on uh, the new plumbing. The data is the new plumbing, and mm -hmm. open data yeah. uh, as a way to, in fact, make uh, government data sources more coherent, while at the same time offering the potential for citizens to use government data for their own purposes. Mm -hmm. um, where in there, if at all, do you see key governance practice that we might model and catalyze with groups around the world? Uh, well, I think you've hinted at some of it already. I mean, I think the, the whole concept of open data and accessibility of data to people outside of government in, in digestible formats and searchable formats, et cetera, could be something. This is, I mean, it seems very technical, but imagine the difference it would make if you really had confidence in what the government was telling you about the statistics that it was producing. And this, you know, this is not something that uh, only really poor countries have pro trouble with. We don't really have a good sense of the data coming out of China, as we all know. So I would say that's one area where there could be very concrete assistance, and we need to figure that out ourselves. So this is an area where, in trying to improve our own governance, we might be able to help others imagine what this could look like in the, the middle part of the 21st century. I also think that it will... The other piece that's being suggested is trying to figure out whether we could come up with some shareable... Uh, statistical frameworks. What are the things we should be asking about? Yep. And how do we do that in a sophisticated way so that we don't drive bad behaviors? Back to my example around homicide reduction. That's not the right measure. So what is the right measure? If we could, working with colleagues from other parts of the world, try to develop some frameworks in certain areas and then build them up collectively, that would be very concrete advance uh, for governance, I think. Thank you. Sir. Sure. 
background in the resource sector and sociology. Um, thinking about what Canada can do. Uh, Canada can really set an example in mining. Uh, with a couple of friends we have gone through the uh, SDGs and we have come to the conclusion that mining can make a contribution to pretty well all of them in one way or the other. This is linked to governance. This is linked to how this whole sector sets itself up and to how the government of Canada plays a role in it. And it was very interesting, this was illustrated about a week or so ago when an, a coalition of NGOs in Latin America sent an open letter to uh, our uh, Prime Minister asking him to implement certain policies with respect to that sector. And this, this really indicates that in the eyes of this endless list of, I don't know if you've seen it, it's, it's, I think it's two or three pages, list of organizations, they look to Canada as a country that can make a difference and probably should. Uh, a second comment, uh, which is sort of related to this, is about measurement. Um, I've done a study of a whole lot of mineral and mining projects, and too many, um, in too many cases people get hung up on measurements. And so I would, uh, I would advocate that measurement is not by numbers, but that there also be a, a, a place for stories. Stories are crucial. Not only that, if you have numbers, and the numbers are going to be used, before they are used and debated, they get converted into a story. Mm -hmm. So we should pay more attention to that. Thank, Thank you. you for a very interesting presentation. Thanks. I completely agree on the second point. It's not that measurement doesn't matter. We, we obviously have to find ways of, of measuring, but it's not enough in and of itself to actually convince people of anything. I mean, this is one of the great frustrations of so many of my science friends who, who you know, can explain the world and uh, think that if they just tell you what the world is like. That's what it says. Th right? That's what it says. That's the data. And therefore, people will change their behaviors, right? I mean, the whole climate change uh, discussion is based on that in some ways. So yes, stories really matter. I could not agree more on mining issues. I mean, if we think about where Canada is actually influential in the world, mining is probably our most important industry. Yep. Yep. Let's be honest about it. And, you know, a lot of Canadians don't like that because mining sounds dirty and it is dirty sometimes and uh, there are lots of as you know organizations that are very uncomfortable uh, with mining practices all around the world but that means that it's a concrete area where if we can improve governance and that is a combination of government and private sector my point from early in the talk that has to be brought together now the Canadian government as you may know is financing a, uh, a center for uh, mining innovation around governance questions at my former university, the University of British Columbia, uh, headed up by Cassie Doyle, who is a former uh, uh, official in uh, the Canadian government. And this is, as I understand it, the very purpose of that organization. Now, they have a lot of work to do because there are some bad actors in Canadian mining. There are also some very responsible actors. And getting to the place where the responsible actors are upheld and, and validated and where those practices of governance, uh, which also include local communities and dealing with indigenous peoples, et cetera, et cetera, as well as the environmental considerations, that's just crucial, I think, if Canada is going to have a good governance reputation going forward. Sir. Bonjour, merci. Mon nom est Christian Tremblay. Je travaille à Oxfam Québec. Oui. Christian Tremblay. I'm coordinator for the youth program. My question is on youth. We're now in a situation, a very explosive world situation. Young people represent uh, a quite large uh, part of the population, 50% in some countries, 80% uh, of these youth people, uh, young people are in southern countries. Most of them are not uh, uh, educated, but, and they're not connected to the internet either, but they're also excluded from the decision-making processes at the local, national, and international level. So how do you see 
How do you see us including them in this process? And what would be the best practices to follow here? I think it's a very important question. Of course, it's a very difficult question to answer. It's difficult to, to set up inclusive uh, systems for youth. I haven't thought enough about it. I mean, as you were talking, I went, ooh, there's something I should be thinking more about. Uh, because there probably have to be very specific governance interventions or changes to try to ensure that there's a, a feeling of inclusion amongst younger people uh, all around the world. You know, this again could be a place where Canada might be a useful model. So we were all very excited that the youth voting in the last election was up. Yeah, it was up. It wasn't up massively, and it didn't. It's not a change of dynamic, in my view. So we need to think about this.、Uh, obviously, we have an aging population, not like many of the countries th that、uh, we work with. But I do think that it's not enough simply to say, "Well, this whatever works for the general population works for for youth in terms of inclusion and in government structures." It's clear that this is an area where, as you hinted.、Um, Online accountability mechanisms,、uh, ways of allowing voices to be heard that actually relate physically to the way young people interact with one another. This is a huge societal shift, and it's going to take some really hard thinking, and probably not by people like me,、uh, because I'm not I'm not adept enough. Right to know what really is going to work. So I guess part of it is sourcing ideas from younger people around how their own inclusion might take place. I know that's I know that sounds it's obvious and it sounds easy and it's really hard. I know that,、uh, but I do think that we might want to be really intentional about trying out in Canada certain certain active. Efforts to include, and then to see how they might be played out, and we need to work with the private sector almost certainly in this,、uh, because that's where a lot of the expertise lies. I wish I could give you a better answer. Sue, Sue Sabo with IDRC.、Um, I'm going to take the risk of bringing up our neighbors to the south,、um, and there's been,、um, I would say, worrying、uh, signs in the、uh, at least in some. I've been reading about the way the campaign may be turning away from internationalism, not just on the side of one candidate, but it may force the others to move away again from having a more international perspective. So my question is, what does it matter, and if so, how that we may see the U.S. at the highest political levels moving away from internationalism? Where does that matter potentially for the SDGs?、Um, Does it also matter for the American foundations? Is there any link there? Do they go off on their own direction?、Um, so the two questions together.、Uh, I think the second part's easier. I don't think it matters greatly to the American foundations. In fact, if anything, I think what will likely happen is that they will feel empowered to be more active and feel that they must be,、uh, and they are unless. There's a new regulatory framework. I mean, if the world explodes and you start to see a, a repressive regime in the United States,、uh, well, you know, all bets are off. But if the same,、uh, if the current legal framework remains in place, I actually think we're going to see a lot of activity on the part of U.S. foundations, for good and ill. I'll be honest,、uh, in my own view.、Uh, the first part.、Um, Obviously, very complicated to assess what would happen. I, I agree with your analysis that there is no matter now which whether the Democrats or the Republicans win the presidency. I think that there has been a bit of a retrenchment, and I think I think also Mrs. Clinton is in her own heart.、Uh, she tends to be.
a, a bit of a hawk on security issues. Uh, so she she's a bit more of an American power person than than President Obama is, and I think we would have seen some shifting no matter what. But I do think you're right that the rhetoric of the campaign has taken that even farther, and you know we've got much more of a concern about the national situation and not so much talk about the international situation. I obviously if Mr. Trump wins, uh, it's utterly unpredictable in my view, uh, because he's utterly unpredictable. I don't know what he stands for. I don't actually think he knows what he stands for. No, I think quite... Narcissism. Uh, narcissism, yeah, right. Uh, I mean, we've never seen anything like this, so we don't know how it's going to play out. One can only hope that there are institutional structures that will make it hard for him to act. I mean, we've seen how hard it is for a very rational, in my view, highly intelligent president to act over the last few years. Uh, I think it'll be even harder for him. He, he won't command a lot of respect within the Congress, probably, if he's elected. And um, I think there will be just dramatic resistance. I think we might even see resistance emerging from the courts uh, in a more aggressive way, even from so-called conservative appointments. So this is where one has to just hope that there is resilience in American democracy. And I, I, like, to, I like to think there is. But I do think there could be very substantial effects on the SDGs. I think the U.S., Certainly, the governmental agencies will not be highly active. And the very idea that I'm trying to suggest there needs to be governance change in the international system and governance change in Western democracies, well, that's not going to be high on Mr. Trump's agenda. I don't even think it's that high on Mrs. Clinton's agenda. Well, please join me in thanking Professor Tu. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thank